Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Howard. I am an alcoholic. Um, my God, as I look around here and I see so many friends, uh, old friends, new friends, dear friends, um, uh, friends I just, Kathy and I just met at Amelia Island, they're, they're here, my friend Dean and my other friend Dean from New York has showed up, and so many other pe- members of our big book comes alive, uh, cadre of lost souls from the Sunday meeting who are here. I love to see you guys, and of course, the love of my life, Kathy, is here somewhere in the Hollywood squares. Um, for you guys, for me, she's right up front. Um, but thank you all for, for, for being here. Um, and also, congratulations to celebrants. Uh, those of you who were, uh, I, there was, uh, I think Jimmy was 46 days, Janice was 30 some odd days, the rest of you, if I missed the name, I apologize. Congratulations to you folks. You truly are the most important people here, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, as uh, was suggested, it might be helpful as we do this if you had uh, uh, your book handy and a highlighter and a pen. It just might simplify things. Um, I'm just going to start out by kind of explaining what this is about. You see, I think if you go to enough meetings, you're going to hear a great many things. And if you've been coming around for a while, you may be thinking, hey, where the hell did they get that from? That is not in the big book. And we just hear so many things repeated at meetings that cannot, cannot in any way be reconciled with the program that's outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is our program. And the program, and the problem is this, if you hear those things repeated enough, they enter our vernacular. They become absorbed into our spoken culture. And the newcomer, and that that for that newcomer, that can be a fatal, fatal mistake. Especially if you believe what Bill wrote, which is unless the, the newcomer follows to the best of their ability our suggested 12 steps, he almost certainly signs his own death warrant. So we've already seen what Bill has to say about some of these things. And uh, I think if, if we look back, where did this get started? Where do we kind of go off the rails a little bit? I think we can start in the late 60s when the grapevine put out an article suggesting that these, these new meetings that were cropping up all over the place called OD meetings, open discussion meetings, that these things might be a good idea. And right after that article, within another 10 years, was this boom in rehabs throughout the 70s and 80s. And this caused a radical, a radical shift in our culture away from the traditional focus, excuse me, on the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, the steps, into a sort of, I don't know, group therapy where anyone and everyone can share, just come and and share whatever may be on your mind. And that's resulted in a significant decline in the success rate in Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I'm not suggesting anybody go to meetings and become a language or a thought enforcer at meetings and correct the words people use. I'm not suggesting that at all. But when we hear something questionable, I think we should ask, first, what's the source of that information? Who is is quoting that, and where are they saying it comes from? And is it consistent with our literature? You know, those of you who know me know I'm a bit of a history buff, and uh, way back in the early 40s, uh, before we adopted our current uh, preamble, which started in 1947. Uh, One of the preambles that was going around was called the Wilmington 
preamble. And I'm going to put it up here for you, at least a section of it that I want to read, because I think it's pretty interesting. And incidentally, any of the things that I put up here today, if you would like copies of it, just send an email to me right here at the Big Book Study at AOL.com and ask for the handouts from this particular presentation. But what I wanted to show you was here in this preamble, down at the bottom, where it says, let me highlight it, we do not speak for AA as a whole, and you're free to agree or disagree as you see fit. In fact, it is suggested you pay no attention to anything which might be reconciled with what is, with, with may not be reconciled with what is in the big book. If you don't have a big book, it's time you bought one. Read it, study it, live with it, loan it, scatter it, and learn from it what it means to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. That came from, like I said, the, the uh, Wilmington uh, preamble, which was, I think, summer of 44 it came out. The current preamble came out in June of 47. So there were a lot of these kind of things floating around. But there are certain things I wish we would have adopted like that to just drive home that point that we need to stay close to the source because that's what the program, you know, and Bill Wilson was said, if, if the book isn't the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, then I don't know what is. So that's our program. And what I want to do is just give you some examples of some of the things we hear in the rooms. And I'm going to quote a couple of areas where I think Bill has addressed some of those things. Maybe not directly, but in a roundabout way and sometimes right on point. And let me get this screen up here so you can see what I'm showing you, so you can see what I'm referring to. And if you'd like a copy of uh, these handouts, once again, all you have to do is send an email to me at uh, the big book study at AOL.com. So let's start with the most obvious, the, the most grievous one of all. Don't drink and go to meetings. How's that? Don't drink and go to meetings. And before I read what's in the big book, let me jump down to the 12 and 12. The 12 and 12 says on page 39 and 40, sobriety brought about by the admission of alcoholism, which is step one, and by attendance at a few meetings, at a few meetings, is very good indeed, but it is bound to be a far cry from permanent sobriety and a contented, useful life. Nowhere here does it guarantee you're going to be happy. A contented, useful life. And if you've read the big book, you know a useful life means spent in service to God and the people about us. This is just where the remaining steps of the AA program come in. Nothing short of continuous action upon these as a way of life can bring the much, can bring the much desired result as a way of life. That just means we do it over and over and over, like breathing, like eating. This is a way of life. Well, so is work in the steps. I'll continue with the 12 steps, to, with 12 and 12, and then we'll go back to the book here in a minute. Bill said on 174, unless each AA member follows to the best of his ability our suggested 12 steps of recovery, he almost certainly signs his own death warrant, his drunkenness and dissolution, and to me, drunkenness and dissolution means relapse. His relapse result from his personal disobedience to spiritual principles. Not that he wasn't making 90 meetings in 90 days. Not that he wasn't taking coffee commitments. His drunkenness and dissolution, his slips, result from the personal disobedience to the spiritual principles, which are the steps. And on page 15 in the beginning, he says, AA's 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in nature, so here we go. He mentioned later personal disobedience and spiritual principles. Here he's defining that spiritual principles are the 12 steps. Spiritual in their nature, which if practiced as a way of life, can expel the obsession to drink and enable the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole. Once again, usefully. If we go back to where I started in the big book on page 14, Bill says, 
And I, I, I can't tell you how many times we refer back to this. If you've been to our workshop, you know how often Howard says, go see page 14 bottom. See page 14. It's the last line on the page. And maybe that's why it gets skipped. I don't know. But it's so critically important that we not miss this line. Because it says, for if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life, here it is, through work and self-sacrifice for others. It doesn't say through going to 90 meetings in 90 days. It doesn't say taking commitments. It doesn't say raising your hand and sharing at every meeting. That's the spin cycle of recovery. Go to meetings, raise your hand, take commitments. Go to meetings, raise your hand, take commitments. That's a spin dry cycle, but it's not a recovery cycle. And Bill is pointing out, if we, don't, if we don't do that, we could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. In other words, the shitstorm of everyday life. We're not going to be able to get through it unless we apply our steps to it and we enlarge and perfect our spiritual life through serious, intensive, one-on-one -on -one work with others. And here's another one I always point out to people. I think that every newcomer, Every newcomer, at the very first meeting they walk into, somebody should take them aside and explain this to them. On page 17, it says, Unlike the feelings of the ship's passengers, however, our joy in escape from disaster does not subside as we go our individual ways. The feeling of having shared in a common peril. Common peril means fellowship. We have shared in this, this common peril of that is alcoholism, that is drug addiction, is only one element of the cement which binds us together. So the fact that we're here in a meeting an hour or so every day is only one element of the epoxy. Remember the days when there was epoxy? Now we got crazy glue. It's just one tube. But there was a time when you wanted to have like permanent adherence like crazy glue brings. You'd have to have these two tubes one chemical without the other wouldn't work. So common peril, fellowship, is one element of the cement which binds us. And here's the other. But that in fact, would, that in itself would never have held us together as we're now joined. The tremendous fact is we have discovered a common solution, the steps. This is the great news the book carries to those who suffer from alcoholism. This book is not about fellowship. This book is about alcoholism and recovery through the spiritual program of the 12 steps. Bill goes on to say on page 34, for those who are unable to drink moderately, the question is how to stop altogether. Whether such a person can quit on a non-spiritual basis, which to me means fellowship alone. Fellowship alone is a non-spiritual basis. Depends upon the extent to which he's already lost the power to choose whether he will drink or not. There was a tremendous urge to cease forever, yet we found it impossible. This is the baffling feature of alcoholism as we know it. This utter inability to leave it alone, no matter how great the necessity or the wish. On page 59, he tells us the steps are suggested as the program of recovery. And we're going to get to this in a little while about the notion that this is a program of suggestions, it is not. It is a suggested program. And then this one, very often, miss, I miss this for 20 years. In the spiritual experience appendix, at the bottom of the page, the first page, it says, what often takes place in a few months through working the steps, and I know I'm inserting something there, but that's what I believe he's referring to, what takes place in a few months by working the steps can hardly be accomplished by years of self-discipline. What's an example of self-discipline? How about don't drink and go to meetings? Meeting makers make it. If that's all you do, I don't think that's going to be the case. We have to do something else. We have to pay attention to the other part of our program. Here's one I find interesting. We'll love you until you love yourself. Anybody, just show of hands, does that irritate anybody as much as it does me? We didn't come here to become narcissists. I don't think we did. 
the book very clearly tells us on page 84, he says, love and tolerance of others is our code. A few pages later on 94, it says, you hope that you will try to help other alcoholics when he escapes his own difficulties. Suggest how important it is that he place the welfare of other people ahead of his own. And on 97, help, um, 97 helping others is the foundation stone of your recovery. So, the quote should be, as, as far as I'm concerned, and I, I should stop saying should be, I think the quote would be completed if it said, we'll love you until you learn to love somebody else. Can't stop at loving yourself. There's way too much narcissism in this world today. Selfish, self-centeredness is the root of our problem. The book tells us so. So why would we come in here with the intention of learning to love ourselves. We come in here and accept ourselves. And if you could love yourself, great. But the objective is to be of service to other people, to give a damn about somebody else. When I first came into recovery, everybody said, got to have faith, got to have faith, got to have faith. You're not going to make it if you don't have faith. Well, I didn't have any of that. You know, my notions of God were so prejudice and, and, and filled with misconceptions. Uh, I thought God and religion were one and the same. I didn't know there was a difference between religion and spirituality, and we'll get to that in a moment. But you've got to have faith, you've got to have faith, is what I heard. But what I read on page 47 of the book is, I cannot accept as surely true the many articles of faith, which are so plain to him, so it was comforting to learn we could commence at a simpler level. And that simpler level, Joe and Charlie taught me, was belief. Start with belief. And based on that belief, I'm able to make a decision to pursue that power by implementing a plan of action, steps 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, 10, and 11, that produce results the first part of the 12th step. So I don't start with faith. I wind up with faith because I define faith as knowledge, surety, experience. And I didn't have any of that in the beginning. All I had was hope. And hope is belief. Faith is certainty. Hope is belief. So you don't have to have faith when you come in here, guys. To all the newcomers here who were told, you got to have faith, got to have faith, got to have faith. Faith comes in time as a result of doing this work. And we agnostics were told that if we open our mind to the possibility of a higher power, that's all. Just open our minds to the possibility, then God will prove to us that there is a God. If we make the decision to pursue him and we implement the plan of action that we're given, the end result will be we have made connection with that higher power. We have faith. We don't believe anymore. <clears throat> uh, let's continue. Here's one that's uh, always amusing. Stay out of relationships for the first year. When no sex in the first year. I know a lot of people are going to be offended at this, but I, I tell my, my sponsees, you can have all the sex you want in the first year. In the second year, you get to have it with somebody else. But in all seriousness, what the book says about these things, and I, I don't know if it's just me, all the information on sex in this book is on page 69. I, coincidence? I don't know. But on 69, Bill says, we don't want to be the arbiter of anyone's sex conduct. Arbiter is judge. If I'm telling somebody to do something or not do something when it comes to their sex life, I am judging them. Bill tells us further in meditation, we ask God what we should do about each specific matter. The right answers will come if we want it. And I think that's something that applies to everything in life. Everything. If we're unsure about something, we put it in God's hands. The right answer will come if we want it, if we let it. God alone can judge our sex situation. Counsel with others, your sponsor, is often desirable but we let God be the final judge. 
From the top of the page on page 70, he says, we avoid hysterical thinking or advice. We're not giving advice. Who, what, when, where, how, why you engage in that activity is entirely up to you. What we do in the sex inventory is we look at the thinking behind the actions. We do not judge anybody's actions. We're not here to judge your sex life. We're here to help you figure out what thinking put you in a position where you might have harmed people that way. Because we know we have a defective thinking process. Well, if it's defective in one way, it's defective in all ways. So how might we have hurt people? And in order to figure that out, we have to figure out what's the thought that led to the action. Uh, let's continue. Here is the great one. This is a selfish program. Hear that all the time. This is a selfish program. Well, on page 20, pretty early on in the book, Bill says, our very lives as problem drinkers, ex-problem drinkers, depend on our constant thought of others and how we may help, may help, ugh, may help meet their needs. How is that being selfish? If my solution lies in the constant thought of others and how I can help meet their needs, that is a selfless program. That is an altruistic description. Page 97, Bill says, helping others is the foundation stone of your recovery. A kindly act once in a while is not enough. You have to act the Good Samaritan every day if need be, it may mean the loss of many nights' sleep, great interference with your pleasures. And incidentally, if you've been in my workshop, when we read this stuff on page 97, we call these the 12 inconveniences. There are 12 steps. There are 12 concepts. There are 12 traditions. And if you read on page 97, Bill tells us right here, if you count them, there are 12 inconveniences. If you do 12-step work, you're going to run into all of these. And I'm not going to read them all or count them all. You can do that. Trust me, there are 12 there. On page 14, Bill says, if an alcoholic failed to perfect it in large, this is what, so important that we're now reading this for the second time. It applied to something else earlier, and now it applies to this. If we don't perfect and enlarge our spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, he could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. Remember our friend Jim and more about alcoholism? We told him what we knew about alcoholism, step one. We told him what we knew about the solution, step two. Quote, he made a beginning, step three. But that's as far as he got. He failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life because there's no such thing as staying on step three. If you decide to do something and don't do it, then you're not on that step. You're just another frog on the log. And I hope all of you know what that's about. Page 62 says selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles. So if it's a selfish problem, how could that be the root of our troubles? Uh, I'm sorry, that is the root of our troubles. How could that be the solution? So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves, and the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. Above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of the selfishness. We must do it kills us. How about this? On page 77, at the moment, and I think this is where a lot of people get confused. I've had people at workshops point out that this statement says it's a selfish program. If I take it out of context, maybe it is. If I take out the, this, this thing, this line, where it says we are trying to put our lives in order, at the moment we are. But if I look at where is page 77 in the book, what point in my recovery are we talking about here? We're talking about our inventory. And at the moment, we're working on putting our lives together. We work the first three steps to uh, harmonize our experience, our relationship with God. We work four, five, six, and seven to get right with ourselves in our head 
and we work eight and nine to get right with our fellow man. So we're putting all of those elements of our spiritual dis-ease to work. But, he says, this is not an end in itself. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and the people about us. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. And he continues by saying, each day is a day when we must carry the vision of God's will into all of our activities. Doesn't sound like selfish to me. And there are a few other quotes here. Page 97, helping others, the foundation stone of your recovery. Patience, tolerance, understanding, and love are the watchwords, not what can I get out of it for me. You will awaken to a new sense of responsibility for others on page 120. I'm going to just start jumping around in a bit because we'll never get through it all at this rate. But here's one that drives me absolutely batshit. Just do the next right thing. I, if I knew what the next right thing was, I'm in the wrong place. What am I in this book for? What am I doing this work for? So if I have to figure out what is the next right thing for me to do, if I have to make a decision about something, you know, I've heard people say, well, what would God have you do? Well, at this point in reading the book, if I'm up to page 60, I don't really know that for sure. But on 61, Bill gives me a hint. He says, is he not even in his best moments a producer of confusion rather than harmony? Bingo. If you're not sure of what the, quote, next right thing is, ask yourself, is it going to produce confusion or harmony? If it produces confusion, sounds to me like that's not what God would want me to do. If it produces harmony, yeah, I, I, I think that's exactly what God wants me to be doing. And if you want to take it a step further, <clears throat> those of you who are familiar with the Oxford program that preceded our program of action, they had four objectives, absolute purity, absolute honesty, absolute unselfishness, and absolute love. So ask yourself, when I'm thinking about doing the next right thing, is this thing I'm considering doing consistent with purity, honesty, unselfishness, and love? If it isn't, I don't think that's God want, what God wants me to do. In time, I will learn and deepen my understanding of spiritual principles, and they'll include tolerance, compassion, patience, forgiveness, humility, love, and goodwill. And that's what I ask myself. Is what I'm considering doing consistent with those principles or inconsistent? If they're consistent, then that's clearly, I believe, what God wants me to do. If it's inconsistent, I could still do it. God gave us brains to use. It's the proper exercise of the will that counts. So if I start to compromise on those spiritual principles, one of the things you'll find as you proceed in this, this thing called recovery is the road gets narrower and narrower and narrower as we go along. That road for elbow room and, and maybe, you know, twisting a little bit and compromising on some principles. The road gets narrower as we go along. So here's a couple of other suggestions on page 70. We honestly pray for the right ideal, for guidance in each situation, for sanity, which is the ability to recognize the truth, and strength to do the right thing. We may face indecision. We may not be able to determine which course to take. We ask God for inspiration, an intuitive thought or decision. We relax and take it easy. We don't struggle. When I'm struggling over a decision, it's because I'm trying to convince myself of something that my gut is telling me probably isn't a good idea. I'm trying to convince Howard that what he wants to do is consistent with God's will. And my gut feeling is telling me otherwise. Um, hear about this. You only work one step a year. Take your time working the steps. 
And here's a quote that I've had a guy point to and say, this is why you shouldn't have a sponsee working, say, a step uh, before the end of the first year. I had a sponsee with four months. He was in his deep into his fourth step. And a guy with 20 years told him that your sponsor is rushing you. Four months in sobriety is way too soon to be doing a fourth step. And when I finally cornered that guy and asked him how many other people has he killed with that kind of advice, I pointed out that what it says in the book is sometimes a man is anxious to proceed at once. You may be tempted to let him do so. This is sometimes a mistake. If he has trouble later, he's likely to say you rushed him. So, yes, it does say not to rush the guy. But if you turn to the previous page, this statement comes after Bill says on our first visit, on our first sit with that new prospect. And it doesn't tell us not to proceed. It tells us to use our judgment. And on the very next page, on page 96, Bill is already pointing out on the next visit, and that could be later the same day, it could be a phone call in an hour, on the next exposure to that prospect, Bill says, if he indicates a desire to go forward with it, get busy right away on the second visit. And that could be within the same day. So no, it doesn't say take your time with the steps. Some people take uh, that, that quote, uh, of, um, first things first. Um, well, I'll get to that later. I don't want to get too deep into this. And I'm going to skip ahead because we are running a little short on time. Um, some of these are so important. But like I said, just if you want copies of this, ask me about it. How about when it comes time to do the sixth and seventh step and someone says, that's a defect that I can never change. Uh, that it's just the way that I am. I can't change that. Well, the book tells us something else. And the book points out to me in general that basically if I am saying that I have a defect that God cannot remove, I'm saying that my defect is stronger than God. That's saying I'm God. I'm playing God. That my defect that I'm not willing to let go of is because he can't take it away from me. Does not say to stay just the way we are. Bill suggests in 12 and 12 that maybe the thing to do is to say this. Um, you, uh, the moment we say no, never, our minds close against the grace of God. Delay is dangerous and rebellion may be fatal. Why not say this? Instead of this, I will never give up. How about just say right now, yet. This I cannot give up yet. So we don't close the door on the defect and we don't close the door on God. This I cannot change today. I'll focus on something else today. Um, I'm going to skip through a lot of this. Let's get to some of the expressions that uh, we hear all the time in the meetings. Um, hey, don't we, let's do this one before we go on. How about shut up and listen? Take the cotton out of your ears and put it in your mouth. A newcomer comes here wanting love, wanting acceptance. We create, those of us who are part of the fellowship of the spirit, create an atmosphere in the meetings that's called the spirit of the fellowship. And we create that love and harmony by making that newcomer feel welcome and loved and not judged. And telling somebody, shut up, is not a very loving statement. I've never said that to somebody I love. I never will. And what the book says is he encouraged us in working with others. We are encouraged to let the prospect speak. When you discover a prospect, find out all you can about him. He can't tell me anything if he's got cotton in his mouth. Encourage him to speak of himself. If he wishes to talk, let him do so. If you do stay, let him steer the conversation any way he likes. 
if you look at those three statements, one of the things that's abundantly clear is we are in control of the conversation, right? When we need this information, we'll find out all we can. We're going to encourage him to speak of himself. And if he's willing to, we let him. If I'm letting you share in this, this conversation, I'm controlling the conversation. And here it is again. Let him steer the conversation, which means we're giving that control to that person. We are relinquishing control of the conversation. That doesn't mean when we ask that newcomer to talk, he goes on and on and on. That's not what it's about. Um, let's jump ahead here. How about recovered? We're told we're not supposed to use that word. Well, if you've ever read the big book on the very first page, on the title page, there is a promise. And that promise includes the word recovered. The story of how many thousands of men and women have recovered. If you turn the page, it says we have Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. We've recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body. And to show others precisely how we've recovered is the main purpose of this book. And maybe it may be helpful here for me to kind of define some terms. Whenever we talk about things, I like to be clear on what I mean and what other people may mean. When um, I use the word recovered, I believe when the book uses the word recovered, as opposed to cured. Recovered just means the symptoms of my disease are no longer present. The symptoms aren't there. What are the symptoms of my disease? Well, let's start with the obvious, drinking and drugging. <laughs> if I'm not drinking and drugging, that's a big symptom that's not present. If I am the source of confusion and conflict to everybody around me, that is a symptom that doesn't exist if I'm not drinking. I tend to be a source of harmony to those around me. I see it. I see it, Charlotte. I tend to, tend to be a source of harmony rather than a source of confusion. So the symptoms of my disease are no longer present. If I say cured, that just means my disease my disease is not present anymore. I will always have this disease. It's always just one stupid idea, one thought away from waking up the beast. But it's over and over in the, in the, in the book. Um, I've counted so far now 33 examples of recovered and recovering in the book. They're all listed here. If you want to get more information, just let me know and I'll send this to you. Now, how about this? There are no musts in AA. You know that? There are no musts in AA? Well, if you read this book, we've now counted almost 120 of them. Sometimes they appear as the word must. Sometimes they appear as words like imperative. But it's the same thing. Had to, when you see had to in this book, a necessity, that's a must. Required is a must. I had to. And you'll find this all through the book. The use of this word, this, this phrase, I had to. That is a must. So we highlight them in green for what it's worth in the workshops because there are a lot of musts in this program. Um, I'm going to jump ahead here to... Uh, one of my other favorites, I know we're running out of time, so let me go to, ahead to uh, the approach references. Somehow in today's culture, it became acceptable to take the attitude of, quote, being available to the newcomer. And the book doesn't say that at all. The book is emphatic. It wants us to approach the person who's struggling, who needs help. And it says it over and over and over again. Had a man's brain be cleared before he's approached, he had come to pass his experience along to me. That's an approach. My schoolmate visited me. That's an approach. There's several references to the word approach without even having to use other terms. We've now counted, I believe, it's now about 30 some odd examples of approach in this book. And I'm going to wrap it up with this thought. 
And again, you're welcome to have all of this. Um, you know the thought that you can only keep what you have by giving it away? Well, that concerns me because it, in, it intimates that in order for me to stay sober, I must, must help others. That means I'm doing something out of fear. I got alcoholism breathing down my back. So if I don't deepen and enhance my spiritual life through intensive work with others, I'm going to drink again. And on page 159, five pages from the end of Bill's writing of this book, he says the following, though they knew they must help others, uh, help other alcoholics if they would remain sober, that motive became secondary. 159 pages he spent telling me, work with others, work with others, work with others. Nothing's more important. Work with others, work with others. On page 159, he says, eh, maybe not. Maybe that's secondary. So if that's secondary, what comes before that? Well, he answers it in the very next question. Bill never asks questions without giving us the answers. And the answer is, he says, it was transcended by the happiness they found in giving themselves for others, for others, altruistic, nothing in it for me. My first sponsor used to always tell me, go do something good for somebody else and don't get caught doing it. That's what I believe Bill is saying. We need to strive for a higher ideal, that not to be working with others just because we're afraid if we don't, we'll use <laughs> that works, but at some point we have to do it because we really, deep in our hearts, want to be of service to other people. And I'll leave it on that. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.